Uh, thank you and welcome back to the session six. Uh, may I request Dr. Ms. Nguyen Thilan Ann to make her presentation. Thank you, Mr. Bo Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, first of all, um, allow me to express my sincere thank to um, the Chief of Indian Navy Staff, um, Admiral Sin, uh, Vice Admiral Chohan, for inviting me to be at the very prestigious uh, regional dialogue on Indo-Pacific today. Uh, I was given a topic to discuss on cooperative regional solution to address the disruption of the maritime uh, rules by order and uh, first of all, I'd like to um, briefly touch upon the cost to cause the disruption. Um, perhaps for my uh, personal opinions, there are three main causes that cause the disruption of the maritime rule based order. The first and foremost is the exercise of power to arbitrarily interpret and implement international law. Second, it is a lack of effective enforcement mechanism that to some what extent tolerate the violation of international law and allow the um, violation of international law repeat again and again. And the third course, I believe that is perhaps is implementation of the gray zone tactics. For the last two days, we have been listened. Um, a number of gray zone tactics has been employed, not only in the Indo-Pacific region, but also up to the Baltic Sea and other part of the world, for example. And it is a gray zone tactic that cause tension, um, core coercion, that under the threat of armed conflict, that cause difficult to address and prevent um, with others. So therefore, um, based on the cause of the disruption, I'd like to find the solution. And thanks for um, Vice Admiral Chohan, I think he gave me a very easy answer easy question so I can find easy answer. So the solution actually as, um, has been announced in the BI summit in um, this year, 2023. So during the BI summit, President Xi of China announced that um, the war order that China would like to build for the time to come is a shared future for mankind which, in which the two elements should be emphasized. The first element is economic development and stability will be a priority for all countries. And second, every country will be treated in equal manner um, toward a common prosperity. What more we can seek for, for that, more than this? I really love to hear this um, prospect outcome. And I think with that, I will end my presentation here. And thank you for your listening. Um, and also, <laughs> You know, like from this um, speech, it's not just speech, it um, transferred into the law. So in July, the 1st of July, 2023, this year, China enacted the law on foreign relations, in which it have two parts. I consider the first part contained in Article 33 and Article 32 as very much dogmatic as kind of defensive measure to uphold the international law order that China very much uphold and adhere to with the centric of the UN, the United Nations. So those are the two measures. The first one, Article 33, mentioned about China will take counter-responding, counter-measure, uh, restrictive measures. And Article 32, China mentioned that China will take it's going on, it is a large chapter when it's mentioned about the international order. Um, it's going on to say that China will call for the reform of international order, and by changing the internet order, China introduced what has been introduced so far some years ago, and is the 3G in initiative, the global security initiative, the global development initiative, and the global civilization initiative. That's it, that, that's all we have, and it's beautiful. So this is really the solution. But I remember that Vice Admiral Cho Han said he's very scared with what China say. He need to look at what China do or China does. But however, it's really a different, not just between word and deed, 
but it's different in different occasion of the speed as well. So also within this year, the um, Chinese spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, made a statement in the, um, on the memorization of the uh, Tribunal Award. It's on the 12th of July um, this year. And the first part of the statement said that the arbitral award, the arbitral tribunal violated the principle of state consent, exercised its jurisdiction untravin, and rendered an award in disregard of the law. So I just quote in the previous slide the law on foreign relations that mentioned that China won't take judicial measures. And in the other statement, China said that no, the arbitral tribunal actually illegal. So how can we believe that? In another comparison, I just like to quote the statement made in uh, 2016 from the Ministry of External Affairs of India, where uh, India recognized that the award of the arbitral tribunal constitute under Annex 7 of the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea in the manner concerning Republic of the Philippines and the People's Republic of China. So if having no background in international law of the sea, who we should believe? Who say the truth? Luckily, we have seen the teasers of um, the panel. An UNCLOS serve as the legal basic to attribute the right and obligation of country at the ocean. And in UNCLOS, it also includes the part on dispute settlement. And as a member state, when you ratify the convention, you gave the consent in advance. So therefore, it's really groundless to say that it violates the consent of state, because you gave it at the time you become the member state. The statement of China went on to say um, somewhat that I haven't found any evidence to support you, and I will seek. Um, the support from your audience. I asked the same question at Milop's conference seven months ago. I haven't got the assistance though. I hope that this conference with the broader audience will really can help me. The first part is that many internationally authoritative law experts and scholars, including former president of the International Court of Justice and former judge of the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, have written articles to point out the serious flaw in the award in a democratic academia, any like criticism is accepted. It's not an exception that any award will receive some criticism. It's normal. But saying that the president of the court and the judges of eight laws say that the award is flawed, I haven't found one. So I'm really keen to seek your assistance. Another one is that China position is not accepting or recognizing the award had won the support and understanding of more than 100 countries. I haven't found those. It's a long list and haven't filled in the list by myself. So I really seek your assistance again. So really, if you look at what China speak within the white paper on the Global Security Initiative, on what President Xi Jinping really made a public statement in international conference, international summit, or domestic uh, conference. It's really different from what China adhere, so called adhere to international law. So, therefore, I, it's cast a doubt for me whether the, the international order that China is currently advocate for is really reliable and really what we are waiting for. In addition to what China's talk, we also see what China did. I quote a four maps on the screen. Um, the first map indicate in the recent two years from 2019 to 2021, China really make use of the time to acquire the mining resources all over the world and it's all the critical minerals strategic minerals, and the map underneath with the arrow in red arrows, it indicates another, uh, another route. The topic of um, our dialogue is about connectivity, and obviously China contributes a lot to establish the connectivity in over the world. It is the supply chain happen to strategic minerals, and it all end at China. China dominate in refinery, and producing products from strategic minerals. 
it's one of the strategy of China in the long run that it will create a dependency in the supply chain. So in the future, in case of any crisis, that dependency will serve China in causing more weight on their coercive activity to other countries. We somehow experienced this in the time of COVID when we suddenly realized how dependency of the war on PPE on China. The other two maps illustrate another domain, which is undersea domain. The top map in black and white, mainly black and white, indicate a submarine cable route has been seeking for permission to lay in through the South China Sea, and it had been delayed for the last two years. It's the SJ number two. The SJ number one went well without any objection, but SJ number two has been experienced huge delay and perhaps never been laying in the South China Sea. And instead of like the submarine cable leading from the other country, China offered the other route from the beneath um, map with the route in yellow. So this is a substitute. And recently during some consultation with China, um, ASEAN country received the signal that China really want to uh, promote cooperation in submarine cable with ASEAN. So it is an area that first, perhaps, just refuse, just delay, try to create hindrance for the laying of new submarine cable. And then, as long as you have no other choice, come with us. We will promote cooperation and offer the alternative to cooperate with ASEAN country. So with that, I think the solution based on China is not really prospective. And therefore, um, I tried with my humble recommendation to promote, to propose some other solution. And that solution will based on cooperative prisoner solution. The first one, um, thank you so much for my uh, first uh, panelist that already outlined details of the MDA's solution. So this is really, if you have gray zone tactic, you need to setting the light on the gray zone tactic, bring it into light. And the best way to bring the gray zone tactic into light is that sharing information, have other understanding the maritime domain awareness. But I would like to use the word cross domain awareness because nowadays everything connected is no longer just maritime only. It connected to the air domain, the undersea domain, not only physical domain, but also cyber and outer space. So it really is a cross domain awareness. In order to identify who is a lawbreaker, where the law is broken, we need to know what happened. So therefore, in the one hand, we need to share the information that we have. No one knows everything at every time. So therefore, sharing is safe time and effort for us. In addition, with the terms of technology and information. It's easy to be surfer of this information. So therefore, counter misinformation is another strategy that we need to think about. And the map I'd like to share on the screen, actually, is the map in, in March, where China would like to conduct some marine scientific research throughout the Indo-Pacific regions. So all the lines indicate the area that China would like to conduct the missions range from the Indian Ocean, the East China Sea, the South Pacific, and even broader. So therefore, we are living in really a connected region in the vision of China. Comparing note, comparing information actually helped in knowing what is the gray zone target is employing and therefore help it to have a collective response later on. The second recommendation is that would like to promote the interpretation and implementation of international law in good faith. Perhaps the map here will help the Indian Ocean to realize it is a map in the case between India and Bangladesh. In our recent conference in the South China Sea, Indian ambassador attending the conference made a very correct and sharp statement to what the Chinese speaker in the way that um, Indian ambassadors say that Indian in no way can compare with China. Because China um, refused to comply with the word, whereas Indian comply the word and give up thousands of square kilometers of EEC to Bangladesh. And this case is just named as a few of the regional practice 
to use judicial measures to interpret and implement international law. In our region, we also have the case between Singapore and, Indone and Malaysia, Indonesia and Malaysia. We also settle our maritime dispute via negotiation. The recent maritime limitation uh, conclusion between Vietnam and Indonesia, for example, and between Indonesia and Malaysia is all the good practice that I do hope that in the future, as long as the country believes that it is a good way to address the lawbreakers, then we can promote further practice to you either diplomatic or judicial mechanism to tackle with implementing or interpreting international law in good faith. Third, as we are on the panel on legal, legal order, we are talking about connectivity and all the sectors are connected with each other. In order to promote the implementation of the rules-based order, we need the capacity to enforce and that capacity to enforce will come from the integrated deterrence based on security, economics, and technology. Perhaps nowadays, with the changing quickly of technology, with the new gray zone tactic, with many new conflict tension immersed in the world, a time for re resilient. And resilient here, I'd like to call for the supply chain. The supply chain needs to be more strategic. If you recall the map that I showed before, where China made use of the time to acquire the mining resources on, in over the world, China itself cannot have the domination. It also needs the contribution from the other country. Many of them come from the South. And if we think twice, we connect the, into the supply chain more strategically, then we will have better capacity. And also, the capacity building has been taken for a long time in areas of like training, handling the hard assets. Nowadays, with the technology, it's really for the time of soft asset. The extremity differences between the resources from China make a country no way in compete directly with China. But if we use technology, we use of other capacity combined together, then it's very a chance. So therefore, in addition to resilient, I also would like to call for the building capacity in some new area. And those are critical infrastructure, submarine cable, strategic minerals, AI, unmanned and automa automatic vehicle, MDA or multi-cross domain MDA, trade diversification, Trade diversification is very important because given the fact that the dependence on trading with China is really high among us. So trading diversification is really important. Given the lesson learned from Australia, I believe that we do have the way out if we work together to fight the diversification. And finally, it's green energy. In addition to that, those area, I think some of the non-traditional area like climate change, in the first day, we listened to Cleo, when Cleo mentioned about climate change, it's actually a very convenient topic to promoting cooperation. But inside climate change, it may have the element of security. For security is the theme. So therefore, be vigilant with any content that we put forward under the umbrella of climate change or food security. It all connected with each other in order to build up the integrated capacity and deterrence. The fourth recommendation I'd like to meet is increasing the cost of violation of international law. In 2017, Prime Minister Modi, when he spoke at the Shangri-La Dialogue, he mentioned about the idea of making the reform of the United Nations. He did. At the moment, the United Nations is the only institution that allows us to enforce However, with the unbalance, with our style of the Security Council, with the veto vote, it allows some big power easily to walk away from their violation, and we can't find a way to enforce any countermeasure collectively. So therefore, first is to reform the global enforcement mechanism of the UN. Second, why waiting for such a reform, which may take a long time? Other 
arrangement like, for example, minilateral in the form of quad, for example, or even more flexible arrangement of minilateral that we hear a lot during the last two days will help to fill the gap, to enforce, and to increase the cost of the lawbreakers, on the lawbreakers. And finally, um, really, as collective, if I re recall my memory right, in the speech of the vice president in the first day, he said that the most important is to coordinate between sovereign nations. Really, building a collective and effective response to violation of international law will carry out much more weight than individual response. China really loves the policy of divide and conquer. So therefore, if we stick together and send a collective message, China may think twice, and other lawbreakers will need to think twice of the cost that they will have to suffer if they broke the law. And it is a way of upholding the rules-based maritime orders. So with that, I would like to end my presentation here and waiting for the question and comment later on. Thank you.